All right, thanks for having us, Cynthia. All right, so let me share my screen. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of give, um, have a little discussion about this Anvil project to try to introduce it and talk about where it is now and where it's moving into the future. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's talking mostly about Anvil, but some of the, the themes are much broader than Anvil, where there's sort of, you know, there's some emerging technologies I think everyone should be aware of. And, and I just want to kind of have open discussion about um, where they're moving. Um, I also wanted to credit Ennis, he's not on the call right now, but he created like more than half the slides here. So he's, he uh, helped me out enormously. And then behind the scenes, there was a huge team of people that have been focused on this. And um, I, I'm really grateful to everyone that's uh, contributed. So just to kind of open with a very broad introduction. So the Anvil is this analysis platform that's sponsored by NHGRI. So for those of you that aren't really aware of the politics, so I'm sure everyone's heard of the NIH, right? That's the National Institutes of Health. That's organized into, I think it's 27 institutes and centers. And there's a lot of um, independence between the different centers. So, you know, there's you know one for cancer, there's one for heart, lung, and blood, there's one for, um, uh, uh, you know, kidney diseases, for psychiatric diseases. So they kind of get organized into, um, uh, into themes sort of centered around um, either a disease or an organ system or, you know, some sort of major uh, component like that. A relatively new institute is NHGRI, that's the National Human Genome Research Institute. It was initially formed with kind of a singular mission, which was to, uh, to sort of organize and launch the Human Genome Project. So it's, it's a relatively new institute. Over time, it's morphed um, considerably. It started with just, the, you know, kind of establishing the reference, and now it's much broader. So here's just kind of a picture of its research areas. Um, in my mind, it's sort of the molecular biology branch of NIH, where they've been really, really innovative at um, new sequencing technologies for genomes, but also kind of, um, you know, everything omics, so gene expression, looking at protein binding, uh, you know, looking at um, any, anything kind of at the molecular level. It's increasingly thinking about single cell analysis. It's in increasingly thinking about what other data types, other modalities should be augmented with just genomics. Um, to kind of make sense of you know what's sort of happening in development and disease in this very sort of fundamental molecular uh, level. Um, in terms of scope, it's a their annual budget is something like six hundred million dollars a year. Um, so it's it's not nearly as big as say NCI, the National Cancer Institute, but it's still a very you know sizable uh, institute. Uh, historically, NHGRI has funded Galaxy, you know the initial R ones. Um, uh, and more recently, the center grants have been funded through NHGRI. So I consider them like a great friend and um, benefactor to, to, to the Galaxy projects. So, you know, there, there's sort of a lot of goodwill um, uh, be, uh, between them. So in response to, you know, because, you know, initially started basically with one genome, <laughs> the initial reference genome, um, but since then, their mission has grown enormously in scope. You may have heard of these very large consortiums like GTAX or the Thousand Genomes Project or the Centers for Mendelian Genomics or Centers for uh, Common Disease Genetics. Um, I, don't, I don't have a, a precise number on this, but something like on, our, on the order of like hundreds of thousands of genomes a year are sequenced um, through a variety of NHGRI projects. Uh, today, it's a, it's a real challenge um, where you know, huge amounts of data are being generated, you know, many petabytes per year. Um, but they get those data get locked away into various silos. Um, so the number one silo is like the SRA and dbGaP. Um, and then, but that's mostly for published data. For data pre-publication, it gets siloed away at like different institutional uh, computing centers where, you know, there's one at Hopkins, there's one at Bro, there's one at WashU, there's one at Yale, you know, kind of like major research institutes have their own data centers where these data get uh, locked away. Um, so a few years ago, about five years ago, uh, NHGRI had what I thought was the good idea was to try to figure out uh, solutions where data doesn't get locked away in these silos. We don't know. We want to have sort of maximal exposure. We want to have maximal scientific impact from these data. Ultimately, these are taxpayer dollars that are funding these projects. We want to get as much sort of, you know, much bang for your buck, as much science as possible from these data. So the idea is rather than having you know, these huge silos where you have to copy, where it's expensive, it's, it's uh, time consuming to move data around, what if we could flip it around where there is a centralized resource where these data would all be sort of co-located 
And then users could remotely connect to it, you know, through the cloud um, to be able to access these data in sort of a, a standardized, harmonized way. Uh, some of these data are open access, like thousand genomes. You can just freely post them on the internet. You can download them. Uh, but the vast majority of the data um, are controlled access data sets where there's individual like patients, you know, are being treated for different diseases. They've consented to, to sort of um, release their genome data and other measurements uh, uh, for research purposes, but they don't, they don't want it just like blasted over the internet. They want it to be, um, you know, a lot of sort of safeguards put into place um, so that only those that are approved to access those data uh, can do so. Um, that's by, that's the vast majority of those 100,000 uh, genomes uh, per year. So, you know, there's a centralized resource, but there's a lot of, there's a security perimeter um, that is, has been established to kind of uh, add all kinds of protections. So there's uh, encryption at rest, there's encryption between services, there's auditing of who's accessing, there's firewalls, intrusion detection systems that are constantly being activated, you know, to just to kind of monitor the perimeter uh, make sure that only those people that are authorized are able are able to get into these data. Um, you know, I, I know that in you know in Galaxy there's a great tradition of open access and open sharing, and of course when we can, that's what we that's what we we uh, we move for. Uh, but there are these really important data sets that, um, for really good reason, are uh, require these sorts of levels of protection. So that's sort of the the, the initial motivation of AMP. And then uh, you know. To put some um, uh, uh, sort of numbers behind this, so the Anvil was launched uh, through a few, uh, two sort of uh, major awards uh, about four years ago, one to Hopkins, one to Broad with a bunch of sort of subcontracts. And it's taken a few years, but it's, uh, it's really working now in the sense that um, there's a platform uh, we've been able to kind of, uh, uh, it, start, it all kind of starts with the data. We're trying to aggregate these huge numbers of data sets together. Uh, currently, we're approaching five petabytes of data. About 600,000 genomes have all been ingested into the Anvil. Um, again, um, a lot of this starts with these mega consortiums that are looking at you know, common diseases, uh, rare diseases. Um, and then there's a bunch of uh, consortium in the future that have been sort of prioritized. Um, right now, we, and I would guess that we capture um, so I don't know the exact number, C certainly more than 10% of data from NHGRI, uh, maybe as much as 50%. I mean, I think the, the vision is eventually, you know, in the next few years to basically have all of the data generated through NHGRI ingested into the ANVIL. We'll probably never get 100% because, you know, there's a long tail project. Some are very big, some are small, some are, you know, looking at different types of data. We'll probably never get every single project, but the goal there is to get a huge fraction uh, organized into a central platform where uh, researchers can look at it. Mike, can I can I ask some questions, or you want to do it at the end? Yeah, uh, please jump in. Uh, so, is this uh, data as it's produced is directly deposited, or is this sort of you know your your lab does something, um, and then when you want to publish it, you just scramble and put it on there? Yeah, I think this is uh, I think this is what's something that's really special about the Anvil is a lot of these data are being loaded as they're being generated pre-publication. Um, so yeah. for a lot of these like mega consortiums, they're using Anvil where, you know, get a hundred thousand genome sequence, you need to do a mega analysis of it. Um, uh, you know, let's get it uh, sort of cloud first. Um, I'm with you though, Marius, there is this great tradition of just scrambling at the very end to uh, upload data. We're trying to break, but, but maybe that's not going into Anvil. That's directly <laughs> going to the public ones. Right? Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I think it really is sort of changing. Um, we're breaking out of that old tradition of just uploading um, at the very, very end of this process. Yeah. So that's what's going on inside of Anvil and NHGRI. But kind of more broadly, this sort of trend is emerging. Not in all twenty-seven institutes of NIH yet. Uh, but in several of the major ones. So um, like NCI, the Cancer Institute has established their Cancer Research Data Commons. Heart, Lung, and Blood have es established Biodata Catalyst. Um, you know, other institutes are sort of um, uh, joining this effort to have cloud platforms um, uh, to sort of organize and analyze these data. Um, from NIH points of view, it's a way to get kind of the most bang for their buck. If I'm a little bit cynical, um, I think there's what they're looking forward to in the future is actually uh, cost savings um, in the sense that right now, a lot of the institutions, um, including Hopkins, apply for so-called instrumentation awards, 
where we can buy, you know, a million dollars of computing. Uh, doing that at every single university, you know, in the United States starts to get expensive. So instead of distributing and building all these separate data centers, you know, let's effectively have one mega data center that all of NIH researchers uh, can use. So these are efforts are being sort of organized uh, through this thing called the NCPI, the NIH Cloud Platform Interoperability Effort. Uh, today we have sort of buy-in from a few key platforms, but my uh, full expectation is this is gonna grow and grow over time. In aggregate, there's something like 11, well, this is a little bit out of date, but there's more than 11 petabytes um, approaching a million genomes that are all kind of available uh, through these different platforms. Anvil being kind of, um, you know, kind of leading the way here with sort of the most uh, data available. Uh, so it's just, you know, kind of a, a testament to the types of um, data that are being organized um, uh, now and into the future. So we have this, you know, huge amounts of data. It's all organized in the cloud. Um, a lot of it is on GCP. A lot of it is on AWS. In the near future, a lot of it will be on Azure. Um, you know, it's on, you know, commercial cloud platforms. You know, when we're talking about, you know, um, you know, tens of petabytes of data. This is a, a substantial data footprint. Um, they wanted, you know, best in class. They wanted the security. They wanted, um, you know, the distribution network. They wanted to sort of tap into uh, all these capabilities. But data at rest is uh, kind of boring, in my opinion. It's sort of necessary. <laughs> it's essential to have databases. But to me, what gets exciting is when you actually have an active platform where you can have these ginormous data sets and then actually do um, interesting analysis on top of that. So Anvil is, yes, a data repository of sorts, but to me, the exciting part is, in addition to these huge data sets, there's also a variety of different tools that are available to kind of make sense of it and look at it in, in new and interesting ways. So here's kind of the, what we call the Anvil wheel, which is it's, uh, kind of a really, really high level uh, overview of some of the capabilities that are present there. Um, Think uh, capabilities for, for sort of um, programmatic access in different forms, uh, visualization in different forms, uh, user interfaces into the data specifically, and then sort of downstream uh, uh, analysis that are available there. Uh, in, the, in the kind of interest of time, I wanted to just spend a minute sort of reviewing some of the key um, analysis platforms. This is going to be a very sort of superficial um, uh, uh, highlights tour of, of some of the things that are possible and, and some of the things that. Um, uh, you know, are on a horizon in the near future. So on the, on the left here, we have sort of Jupiter and our studio and Bioconductor. I think these are very familiar um, technologies to everyone on this call, so I'm not going to really spend any time on it. I think they serve an important purpose. You know, if, if you if you want to do, you know, really customized analysis, really customized visualization, you know, you, you need to, you know, write some code. I think these are great platforms. Um, you know, they have some trade-offs, um, uh, you know, in, in terms of what you can do. I think, I think they're kind of necessary, but not sufficient in, in terms of what can be done. Um, but they're they're, they're full, uh, fully featured. Um, they're working in a very uh, robust way. Uh, another sort of key component is this uh, workflow description language, or WIDL. This is sort of the primary um, technology that's been adopted for some of these mega consortiums. So if you have you know, a project that has you know, thousands and thousands of genomes, if I'm honest with myself, um, you know, this would be the preferred technology uh, uh, to, to do it. I'll, I'll say a bit more about it in a minute, but, you know, it's extremely scalable. It's extremely flexible. It's very technically demanding um, in the sense that, you know, you know, there's sort of a lot of uh, pretty low level scripting that needs to take place to use it. Um, but, you know, and there's a lot of cost considerations that come with it. But at the same time, if you have a, measure, a mega project, you know, that, that's a very um, effective technology. Uh, in addition to that, there's Galaxy is sort of a first-class citizen in this uh, universe. I'll have a lot more to say about that um, in just a minute. So to give you kind of a sense of what's possible with Whittle, I wanted to just spend uh, you know, five minutes talking about a recent project that I was involved in through the Telomere to Telomere Consortium. This is that project that's been getting a huge amount of buzz uh, in the last uh, few weeks here. So in this project, so um, I'm sure everyone's aware, you know, there is this reference human genome. Um, the first version of it was established in uh, uh, some 21 years ago, uh, sort of first published in, in 2001. Um, and that reference genome has been sort of iteratively approved over the years, but sort of the big challenge there is that it is still missing uh, a, quite a huge amount of sequence. Um, if you open up the reference genome today and you, and you sort of look at chromosome one, instead of beginning, you know, ACGT, ACGT, 
It actually begins N N N N N N N N N N N. There's millions of nucleotides just at the beginning of chromosome one that are unresolved. Where you know we can look under a microscope and use other technologies to see how big the chromosomes ought to be, and we know how much of it has been assembled, so we know that you know there's huge chunks that have been uh, missing. So uh, the ends of chromosomes are uh, these so-called uh, telomeric regions. Uh, the middles of chromosomes are so-called centromeric regions. And you know, just because of the, the way that they're organized, historically, they've just been too complicated um, to make sense of. They, the, the sequencing technology just did not exist uh, to get in there. But kind of the amazing thing is the sequencing technology now does exist where we can you know, kind of look inside of those uh, regions and actually resolve them for the very first time. So we recently published um, uh, this assembly. Uh, it's, a, it's a special sample called CHM13, where we've been able to assemble every single chromosome from telomere to, to telomere, from kind of one tip of the chromosome to the other tip, um, which brought about 200 megabases of additional sequence. And we also fixed megabases of errors that were detected um, through, that, um, uh, through the old reference genome, GRCH38. So now we had this new assembly and one of the key things we wanted to do was like look at it and uh, look at how it, it would impact our analysis and our understanding of human genetic variation. So kind of the idea is we have this new assembly, no, that's great, um, but you know, we have an old assembly, we have a new assembly, we just wanted to do kind of an apples to apples comparison to ask when you look at other data sets, other human genomes, you know, what changes about our interpretation using one versus the other. So we put together a team um, uh, 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 of analysis, there's something like 50 people that were part of just this one team. We're kind of looking at um, trying to answer this question using long read sequencing, short read sequencing, you know, looking genome wide, looking in clinically relevant regions, and just trying to you know be able to ask the question of of what changes by using this new reference genome. So the the data set that we ended up looking at um, is this very famous uh, data set from um, uh, population genetics. It's called the Thousand Genomes Project. That's the name. It's a bit of a misnomer in the sense that today it's actually 3,202 samples. It's called Thousand Genomes, kind of for legacy purposes. At the time, that was a very aspirational goal, and now it's been far exceeded. So it's more than 3,000 samples. Um, it has representation from um, uh, five major continental populations. Uh, within those sort of continents, uh, there's 26 uh, individual populations. That's what this these uh, different stars are sort of highlighted. So it's a, it's a nice um, uh, collection because we get you know, representation from uh, Europeans, Africans, Asians, um, uh, sort of Native Americans. You know, we get sort of a nice um, initial view of, of human diversity uh, through this collection. Another sort of nice attribute of it is that they, uh, all of these 3000 people have been consented for open release of their data. We can just go to the website, you can download their data, it doesn't need to be done in a protected way, um, which also makes you know it nice where any results we have can now be freely shared with the world. You know we don't have to sort of set it up um, behind um, any sort of uh, uh, barriers that can limit access to these data. So it's a great collection. It was uh, very recently resequenced by the New York Genome Center, so it's sort of fresh, high quality data. Um, the one sort of uh, technical challenge of it is um, so it's all compressed data. It's something like almost 100 terabytes of input data. So we knew we wanted to look at this, um, but it's a pretty sizable collection. Um, uh, we actually started the analysis at Hopkins and we realized it was gonna take like more of a year of compute. So we needed to kind of do this in a more efficient, more effective way uh, to be able to look through this. Um, so what we ended up doing it was uh, we developed a workflow um, that could look through these data in a pretty rapid uh, form. In the grand scheme of things, it's actually not that complicated. You know, it's, it's sort of a few major phases to kind of organize and do some pre-processing, a few phases to align the reads and kind of get them organized. Not shown here is then once we have the alignments organized, we can do downstream um, variant calling using GATK. The idea was to kind of follow uh, the protocol established by the New York Genome Center so that we can get an apples to apples comparison where if you just change the reference genome, what changes um, uh, in our interpretation of all these sequencing data. I really wanted to credit my uh, student, Samantha Zartar, who actually wrote all the whittles uh, for doing this. If you haven't seen it before, a whittle is a pretty simple uh, concept, at least from the sort of user experience. So a work, the, it's a workflow language. It's organized into sort of a series of tasks. These tasks can be linear. 
You can also do branching. You can also do aggregation. Um, you can also have some conditionals, but by and large, you know, it's a series of um, tasks that get sort of chained together where the output of one task becomes the input uh, to the next. So it's, it's super simple. The way I think of it is like a turbocharged bash script. So um, this is one of the tasks for aligning the reads. Um, so there's a, of, a bunch of input data that describes like what the read files are, what the reference genome is that we're gonna align to. There's a series of shell commands that are then executed. Um, so this is sort of the fancy bash component. Anything you can express in bash then gets executed. There's a runtime environment that says, oh yeah, this is the Docker container I wanna use that has the Unix tools preloaded into it with how much uh, RAM and how many cores we want. And then there's sort of an explicit listing of which output files do we actually wanna keep. Um, for a lot of uh, these workflows, you're gonna be creating a gazillion intermediate files that are actually not that interesting. So we just wanna sort of decorate, oh yeah, these are the key um, uh, uh, steps. These are the key outputs that we actually wanna save away. And then um, those get actually sort of recorded. Um, so it's a, it's a fancy bash script. Uh, the key uh, to it is their execution engine called Cromwell that the behind the scenes will kind of orchestrate a whole cluster um, where it'll boot up virtual machines of the specified type. It'll load the Docker containers that are necessary. It'll stage data out of, in this case, Google buckets onto the local disk. It'll do the bash processing and then it'll take the uh, decorated files right back to the buckets. So the from a user perspective, it's, it's super simple. Behind the scenes, there's some pretty nice um, engineering to actually orchestrate this at scale um, to be able to connect these different tasks together. Uh, so the compute we were doing was quite substantial. This is a snapshot of the Google Cloud uh, Console where we're like routinely using like 10 or 12,000 cores um, for a few weeks time. So we were able to tap into a few million core hours of computing um, over a few uh, weeks. It did cost money. Um, the computing part of this was about $50,000. So it was a pretty substantial uh, compute, um, but you know, the scientific um, outcomes from it have been enormous. So I, I, have, uh, I sleep very easy at night. I think this was a very good use of resources in order to support um, these activities. I, in the interest of time, I won't go through all the details, but just very quickly, some of the scientific outcomes. Um, you know, so using this new genome, which has resolved um, 200 megabases of um, variants, uh, 200 megabases of additional sequence, we find about a million additional variants in the population. So there's kind of all kinds of new opportunities for discovery about how those variants, you know, impact our health, how they impact disease susceptibility, how they just sort of explain, you know, differences amongst different population traits and how they look and how they behave and so forth. In addition to finding kind of um, a, a substantial amount of, of novel variation, uh, we were able to kind of demonstrate and prove that the variants that we were able to detect are actually of higher quality, where there's a reduction in false negatives, there's a reduction in false positives. Um, and this includes within clinically relevant genes. Um, so, you know, we, we, when we started this project, we thought the whole paper was gonna be about all the new stuff but in, a big part of the paper as well has been improving parts of the genome that we thought we had correctly assembled before, realizing that there were some issues there um, and then being able to reduce, you know, in some cases, a tenfold reduction in false positives in certain uh, key clinically relevant genes. So, and basically in every way we can possibly measure, we see improvements using this new reference genome. You know, we're really, really strongly trying to advocate for its adoption um, uh, just because it makes everything better uh, uh, to use it. So that was all orchestrated through Whittles um, just because of the scale uh, with some downstream processing in R and Python to some degree um, to make a bunch of custom plots to be able to execute um, uh, this custom uh, you know, kind of analysis that had just uh, never been done before. So I'm excited about it. Uh, in the grand scheme of things though, this is a relatively modestly sized project. This was 3000 genomes. A lot of the mega projects are at the scale of like 30,000 or 300,000 genomes. So um, it's a, it, was, it was the biggest single project I've ever been a part of, but in the grand scheme of things is actually like not, uh, not by far not one of the, the largest that are ongoing in the field right now. So it's kind of um, exciting and also terrifying to think about what the future is gonna hold here. So that takes us back uh, to our main story about um, where things stand uh, uh, for Galaxy. So um, 
so it's working well. It's working quite robustly. You know, you can any of us can log into Anvil today in a matter of a few clicks, you know, bring up a, an instance of Galaxy that is fully featured, can do a lot of sophisticated analysis there. Now, I mentioned early on, you know, one of the um, key uh, requirements for Anvil is, you know, great sort of mindfulness for security. And, um, you know, one of the sort of um, um, original de design decisions was, well, how are we going to make Galaxy? We knew we wanted to bring Galaxy into Anvil. That was like a certainty. Um, one of the great sort of choices was, you know, what's the right mechanism to do so? Um, on, the, on the continuum, one extreme would have been to try to mimic something like Galaxy Main, uh, where there was sort of a, 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 a more or less permanent instance of Galaxy that was always running that any user could kind of immediately connect to. Um, that, I think at a technical level, you know, works well. I mean, obviously, main works well. It has, I don't know, 10,000 users a month. Um, but we were concerned about the security uh, uh, um, uh, 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 policies for a so-called multi-tenant system. So a multi-tenant meaning, you know, many users can simultaneously access the same software stack. Um, you know, since, since that time, there's been a variety of security audits. Um, you know, NS helped orchestrate uh, kind of an external review. I think we're like in pretty good shape, um, but you know, through those audits and kind of through our own reflections, you know, I, I think there is some work that needs to happen um, if we're going to be able to, you know, kind of confidently be able to have a multi-tenant uh, system that is accessible for protected data sets. I think it could be done um, if we want to reach that so-called FedRAMP uh, certification. There's a very long checklist of items that we need to address, um, some of which are just procedural in the sense that every uh, there's a there's a set of requirements about how code changes are um, uh, um, committed, how they're reviewed, um, how uh, testing is executed. I think we're kind of moving in the right direction, but if I'm honest, you know, it would be a pretty substantial cultural shift, you know, if we wanted to go pursue that. Um, I, I think there, are, you know, there are pros and cons to that I, that concept, um, but in the here and now, um, it wasn't practical to execute um, in that sort of scenario. Um, it's sort of the time frame that we had available with the sort of level of funding that we that we had available. As an alternative model, and this is what's available today, uh, was instead of having a multi-tenant environment where many users would connect to one centralized galaxy, uh, we've 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 moved into a um, a single tenant model where individual users can boot up and manage their own um, uh, version of Galaxy. This way, there's sort of protection. Where if I'm using Galaxy with my data. You know, none of you can see it, even if, but, uh, but you're allowed to have your own independent uh, versions of Galaxy. If my Galaxy needs to sort of interact with your Galaxy, you know, you would, you would have to have an explicit export, um, you know, through, of, of one that can be done through the, the workspaces that could be done in, in the case of tooling uh, to say uh, doc store um, where, you know, there are ways to kind of share information, but it's, it's a few extra steps um, so that security is really sort of uh, central there. By the way, that's uh, sort of just one layer behind the scenes, um, and I really credit Ennis for putting together a lot of these diagrams, uh, is the, the kind of the user uh, facing component uh, is so-called Terra. There's an API layer called Leo, um, where through a Leo command, there's a single Helm chart um, that launches a Kubernetes cluster, you know, that where you can kind of dial in how many nodes and how many cores and how much disk you want to have there. That then execute that sort of boots up um, Cubeman that can, then, can kind of bring up the whole Galaxy stack. And then, like I said, if you want to kind of um, work with that, because it's kind of a fresh installation, you can bring in data from workspaces, you can bring in tooling from, say, Doc Store on demand as needed. Uh, just one more uh, sort of diagram here is you know, because we're using Kubernetes to sort of orchestrate all of this, you know, we have a lot of flexibility. If you need, you know, uh, uh, 100 nodes, no problem. You know that can that can be kind of booted up. It's all kind of executed through one command. We can basically get um, effectively any number of job handlers, any number of sort of resources uh, behind the scenes um, to be able uh, to do the analysis there. A couple more uh, screenshots. So this is a, a screenshot I took uh, last night, uh, kind of showing how you launch Galaxy inside of Anvil. So you know you kind of click this button, create a cloud environment that brings up this sort of um, uh, uh, a configuration panel where you get to pick, you know, how many nodes, how many CPUs, memory, how much disk. The basic deployment is 53 cents per hour. So it's not free, but, you know, for the cost of a cup of coffee, you know, we can, we can boot up a fully featured instance of Galaxy. 
where you get full access to the, all the components that are there, um, um, you know, just as if you, you know, you're connected to Maine or, or to EU, although it's you know, tightly coupled to these data sets where you get access to being able to do all this sort of amazing analysis. What's one thing that's like really cool to me is, you know, you can just sort of dial in how many nodes you want. So if you want your own dedicated cluster with 800 cores or 8,000 cores, it's very accessible and easy to do so. It does cost money, uh, but again, you know, for some of these scientific projects where we're gonna be making great discoveries, I think spending some money is, is, is probably a good use of resources. Obviously, uh, we don't wanna be wasteful. You know, if we can, um, you know, minimize the spend that is uh, in there, obviously that's something we wanna do. We want to be aware of those costs, but um, sometimes it's it's uh, it's uh, definitely um, uh, uh, kind of a, an appropriate use of resources. Uh, once that's booted, you'll get a very familiar version of, of Galaxy. It's branded Anvil with you know kind of the color scheme and some of the logos, but it's just you know it's exactly the same code base that's executing there. Um, so everything you could do inside of you know any other instance of, of Galaxy uh, is available. One really special part, and I really credit uh, Luke and others for kind of building this, is that, you know, so this is running um, in a Kubernetes cluster uh, inside of Google. You know, if you want to, one of the main things you want to do is look at the data that you have available in your workspace. So this could be, you know, all of thousand genomes. This could be all of the um, uh, centers for Mendelian disease genomes, you know, basically unlimited, almost effectively unlimited. Uh, amount of data you might be interested in, you can go in and just browse that, you know, right through the Galaxy uh, UI. Uh, once you kind of identify the data sets that you're interested in, you know, in a few clicks, you can then ingest these data out of the Google buckets uh, into the Kubernetes cluster uh, where, where Galaxy's, uh, you know, kind of really running. And then, like I said, all of the familiar features, so run tools, workflows, import, export, um, uh, workflows, histories, data, you know, all of that is available today. It's working really well in a really robust way. And again, I really credit a ton of people that have um, uh, contributed to, to making this stack um, just as awesome uh, as, as it is today. Uh, there's also nice features where um, it can auto pause, um, you know, and then once you're done with your um, analysis, you can kind of totally turn off the cluster. Um, you, uh, you know, you can put it back in a residual state that costs like uh, one penny per hour. Uh, or you can delete it entirely if you're entirely done uh, with the analysis. So I think you know, you know, Anvil and specifically Galaxy on Anvil is a really exciting platform, right? We get secure computing uh, with direct access to huge numbers of data and growing every day. Uh, we can use Galaxy without any sort of fixed quotas. There's no competition for queues because it's kind of it's your own private um, for instance of Galaxy that you can run with. We can connect data in novel ways. You know, we're going to make those scientific discoveries. Um, just last week uh, at NHGRI Council, they have approved the renewal for at least five more years of Anvil. I, I, I kind of think that this is going to be the sort of project that, you know, in a hundred years and a thousand years, it may not be called Anvil anymore, but this is, in my mind, clearly the right thing to do um, from a sort of um, a government uh, point of view. So I think there's going to be continued interest to build out these resources and, and make them. Uh, even more uh, powerful, even more capable uh, in the years to come. Okay, so that's sort of the exciting part. A couple of reflections. So uh, one sort of mega reflection is, you know, uh, I think historically Galaxy has really led the way in terms of, um, you know, making uh, uh, tools accessible, making uh, science reproducible, um, but there is effectively fresh competition, uh, be, you know, through Terra, through DocStore, you know, there are workflows that can be executed in a very uh, uh, reproducible way. Um, they are get hardened, you know, they, they, they at, a, at kind of a high level, they have some of the same uh, virtues that we've been highlighting in Galaxy for uh, more than a decade. Um, so how do we maintain our competitive edge? In the here and now, uh, in terms of accessibility, in terms of ease of use, Galaxy wins by a landslide, by a landslide. Um, it takes a thousand clicks. It's very complicated to write a whittle. Um, it's sort of very cumbersome to, to modify them or do anything interesting with them. But nevertheless, it can be done. And for users that are comfortable with, you know, bash scripting, um, you know, we, we have to be really mindful of that um, uh, competition there and, and how do we maintain our competitive edge. And then kind of the other mega reflection is how do we optimize the, Gen the, the Galaxy on Anvil experience? Um, I think you know this cloud platform is here to stay for many years to come. You know, um, 
you know, whittles are ridiculously um, uh, simple because they leverage all the cloud technologies about buckets and cloud native APIs. You know, behind the scenes, there's a lot of cool stuff that is um, executed. You know, how can we tap into that sort of uh, amazing capability um, to kind of just make the galaxy all the more successful, all, all the more um, uh, powerful? So a couple of wish list items, and I think uh, basically all of these are in uh, in progress right now. Um, but this is just sort of my top um, top of the line wish list. You know, number one is for that TDT project. Step one of the analysis is like moving around 100 terabytes of data. You know, what I'm excited to hear. You know, remote data um, type ac activities are on the near horizon. That will immediately be uh, transformative uh, to the experience. Kind of uh, tightly coupled with this, you know, now that we're talking about projects in the hundreds of terabytes to petabyte scale, you know, I think we got to be really mindful about, you know, what's data are kept. You know, can we leverage buckets instead of, you know, clearly not, you're not going to get a five petabyte SSD. Um, so kind of leveraging these um, cloud uh, object stores, I think in the long term is, is going to be really essential. Uh, things like optimizing the launch, you know, in the here and now, it takes a few minutes. Which is, you know, for analysis, it's going to run for two weeks. Five minutes doesn't really matter. But if we're, you know, if we're trying to, you know, really uh, harmonize that user experience, is there some way that we can bring up, you know, in a matter of a few seconds, even if it's a very minimal UI, you know, just some sort of um, some way to give exposure, you know, very quickly so people can see what's going on there. And then in terms of tooling and workflows, you know, trying to harden the existing suite, add more tools for human genetics. I'm very excited to hear that you know things like user installable tools are on the horizon. You know, sometimes when you're in the middle of a project at 2 a.m., you know, I don't necessarily want to write a whole wrapper for a tool. I just want to get my analysis done at 2 a.m. So that sort of uh, capability, I think, it will also make the platform a lot more attractive to um, a broader range of uh, uh, analysts. I love this. It's amazing. Thanks for stating this because that was not at all a, a unanimous view. <laughs> I mean, I get it, you know, um, you know, the danger is suddenly everyone's going to, you know, write one offs that are never shared. Um, but I think we have to be kind of flexible and open minded about this, you know, maybe not every single tool needs to end up with a wrapper, you know, maybe sometimes we, we can acknowledge this is only going to be run you know, once. Um, if we want to make this a platform for everyone, including pretty sophisticated analysts, you know, I think having this capability is going to be really transformative. Yes, I think the the moment I started working, I, I, the moment I started working on Galaxy and talked to other people about this, they were all like, "But I have to be admin, right?" And I mean, that's another thing that works around this, yeah. which is not a problem on Anvil, but just in general, it should just be possible to plug in your script. I agree. I agree. You know, it's. I mean, it's one thing. You know, you know, once the workflow is is developed and you know, you just want to run it a thousand times. That's one thing. But, you know, the way that these projects have to go is there's this initial phase where it's very exploratory. You're not, you know, you're really not sure what it is exactly you want to do or, or how it's going to look like. There we just want to be super nimble um, uh, uh, to support that sort of analysis. I'm wondering, I'm wondering if, if others have any kind of thoughts or comments. This, you know, this is just my, uh, uh, my personal uh, impressions here. Um, I'm, you know, like I said, you know, Galaxy is working now. Um, it's amazing. It's super solid. Um, I, you know, my goal here is just to kind of, um, kind of plant the seed that, um, you know, let's let's consider this, you know, in a really really deep way. And, and what sort of opportunities are there to make it even better for the future? Yeah, I mean, you, you, I mean, so if if I can say something, uh, when you talked about the um, reanalysis of the resequenced uh, thousand genomes project, I mean. You've answered this question already, sort of, but I, I was wondering, okay, so why not take the extra step to do it in Galaxy? Um, and I mean, of course, you, you mentioned some of the limitations, but I also think we need these big projects to be in. I, I think yeah. a lot of uh, improvements are coming out of the VGP project, um, but it's, it's not the same sort of uh, considerations, right? So for this project, a lot, is, a, a lot of focus is on like efficiency, efficiency of transfer of data, and it's... I mean, it's relatively removed from the core team of doing an analysis like this, right? So if we said, okay, we want to be able to redo this and maybe beat Whittle in terms of execution time, 
I don't think that's impossible, right? But it needs but more it. knowledge now than we could easily do, like, you know, get started. So I guess my question is like, what do you think we need to do so that this becomes an option to people that right now would prefer writing Widdle? I, I totally love the, the, the spirit of what you're saying. And I should comment, um, uh, this is, you know, the, the genome that was just published will be the first of many new reference genomes that are uh, put out. Um, you know, there's through something called the Human Pan Genome Reference Collection, uh, Consortium, there's something like 350 additional reference genomes that are being created. And that's just NHGRI. I anticipate in the near future, there's going to be, I don't know, thousands of, of, of human reference genomes and beyond. And you're right. Um, I would love in, say, a year's time to be able to do this whole analysis entirely in a galaxy. Um, I would, you know, I'd be open to if that was galaxy in Anvil or galaxy on main, you know, it's open access data. So some of the usual privacy considerations are, are, are not even a factor here anymore. Um, the, the reason that we picked Whittles was, you know, was, was kind of uh, this number right here. Intermediate data was like five petabytes. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's a very interesting thing that you mentioned that we didn't, didn't even put on the roadmap, but I mean, it's obviously something that, you know, we, we've ignored for a long time because nobody really said, well, but we really, really need this, right? Yeah. Um, and I think this is actually more, well, I mean, I shouldn't say this, but this is as valuable as keeping the initial import step remote, right? So that, you know, the the you know, 100 terabyte of uh, input data doesn't need to appear in Galaxy's object store. I think it's just as important that intermediate files that you don't need, don't even need to be transferred back, right? Yeah, you know, no, clearly some of them need to be transferred back, but we probably don't need to collect every single intermediate file. <laughs> yes. You know, at least not forever, at least not forever. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, genomics has been an evolving field. There's new technologies all the time. There's new questions and new types of questions. So. I think this is just sort of um, the progression of the field, and I think it, it can motivate us in Galaxy to, you know, adapt adapt to the, the changing landscape. I'm wondering if anyone else has any um, impressions. Like I said, I know many of these things are, you know, kind of in flight already, so that that's awesome. <laughs> I think we're uh, we're already kind of pointing in the right direction, and you know anything we can do to go even further, because we're this is just the very beginning. This is just the very beginning. I mean, at this at this point, I think it's also very good to just have like concrete use cases that drive development, because sometimes you're you're working in a bit of a, a vacuum, and you don't really know. Okay, um, if I'm going to spend the next six months of my life doing yeah. this, will it be worth it? Right? Or is it something that yeah? It's nice yeah. to have, but that, that's that's a great idea. I mean, one you know natural thing we could do is sort of you know kind of formalize this as a use case, and it's highly scalable. You know, we did three thousand two hundred two, but there would have been value to do thirty genomes or three hundred genomes. So, you know, I think we could we could set up some intermediate goals that would be scientifically valuable, and then you know from those we could kind of look to the future um, to to tie all these pieces together. Has has there been any work to convert? the sort of reproduce the workflows that you've used here in Galaxy yet? And would that be uh, interesting at all? That's an interesting question. I, I think uh, many of the tools are available. Um, maybe not all of the components of GATK that we use were, but I, I, think, mm -hmm. I think many of them would have been, yeah. I mean, there's also the ongoing effort to support CWL, where I understand there is some conversion possible between the two. Yep. Um, so that would be another option for workflows that already exist. Um, again, there was a big discussion: is it even worth doing this? Because you know, then you end up with parallel pipelines, uh, pipelines defined by somebody else. But I think this is just you know, this is a production pipeline, and for reproducibility's sake, you may want to execute it the way it was written. I, I agree, and, and we've had um, subtle bugs introduced when we try to we've converted from like Snake Make to other workflows and. Subtle bugs pop up, so um, you know being able to just run the native, hardened, tested workflow it, it brings a lot of value to. Yeah. 
I mean, we always have, in, in general, there's always going to be workflows that people publish that aren't going to be polished by the IWC, but that's kind of the point of the IWC is having those specifically hardened workflows, but that's not to say that there's no benefit to having things outside of that. I, um, a, a random thought is that I, I really like this wish list. I'm, I'm 100% with Marius that user installable tools are so important and doesn't don't ever get sort of um they, they don't they don't ever sit at the table the way i think they should um and this you know purging the intermediate stuff and, and workflows we spent a lot of time like i mean i again i just wanted to echo what maria said in, in in terms of like the initial data is not so i mean we've we've done it we made a bunch of progress towards it it's good that we did that but we could run a whole workflow on a node on anvil and just collect the outputs of the workflow and we're I mean, it feels like that would be, I don't know. It, it, it feels like there needs to be a pipeline to get from Anvil, from these like Anvil wishlist things that are things that would really just help Galaxy in general into like the core team or like onto the roadmaps and stuff. And I just wanted to like, I don't know, shout out those two particular things, which I, I think, I mean, obviously are, 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 are big, important, exciting developments that, that should happen and presumably could happen um, in, in, you know, we could, we could have both of those things done in the next year if we put our, um, if they became priorities. So I just wanted to sort of so echo Marius. I think those should be priorities and it's really good to see an awesome use case awesome. for them. Yeah. And I, I don't know about ongoing projects and I mean, everybody's drained, uh, or I don't know, maybe I'm just extrapolating for myself. I mean, we're, we're pretty busy, but you know, I mean, if if another thing like this comes up and um, you know, you say, okay, now we want to scale an analysis uh, of that size or more, um, we just you know want to see how far can we get with Galaxy. I think that's something where an engineer's time is well spent. I love it. I love it. Let's let's do that. Let's do exactly that. Um, like I said, there's going to be. You know, additional genomes coming. You know, through VGP, there's you know uh, equally exciting work going on. So we're we're perfectly poised to do this. And if we can kind of tie analysts with some of these use cases, or engineers analysts with some of these use cases, I think that could be enormously impactful. Awesome, awesome. And you know, I, I also appreciate you know th this is all of these are not five minute jobs, so. It's the kind of thing where you know months or years of work uh, are going to be ne necessary to fully achieve it. But I think it's useful to have a long-term vision as to where things are heading. All right, thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Mike. Uh, we are over time, but if there's any additional comments or questions, you can take them. Yeah, we should, we should probably wrap. I would say just poke me on, on Slack or wherever uh, if, if, you, if you want to chat more. And um, uh, I'm looking forward to the um, work group meeting in, what, a month's time or so. And then I'm especially looking forward to seeing many of you in person at GCC in two months. Time. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everybody.